Welcome. Hallelujah. How many of you know he's alive? Isn't that good news? Man, you look beautiful. Well, I'm excited about today and what this means to a global community of believers throughout the entire world today. People are celebrating and are grateful and thankful for the resurrection of Jesus. And we're participating in that global family. Jesus has made a remarkable difference, not only in our world, but obviously in many of our hearts and in our lives. And the resurrection is a powerful truth. And we're not just celebrating something that was a historical event, even though Jesus historically has risen from the grave. We're celebrating, according to John eleven twenty five, 25, a person, a person. For years, I thought Easter was just an event that we celebrated that happened years ago. Or once you accept Jesus as Lord of your life, then you have the certain hope of the resurrection to come. Jesus is coming back and there will be an appearing of Jesus and his kingdom and the dead are going to be raised. But Jesus at Lazarus's tomb brought us to a place of, of resurrection power that we're not just celebrating an event. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. So I'm celebrating a person and the experience I have in him and the joy of this resurrection power in my life. You can visit every tomb of every founder in a religion today, and that founder can be found in that tomb. But Jesus has no rival. He has no equal. You can visit his tomb, but he's not there. Amen. He's not there. He is alive. He came out of the tomb. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that if Christ is not risen from the dead, your faith, my faith is in vain and we are yet in our sins. Think about that. That's why I'm celebrating. That's why there's a global family celebrating because if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, again, our faith would be in vain and we would be yet in our sins. The good news is Jesus has been raised from the dead. Your faith, if it's in Jesus, is not in vain and we are no longer in our sins. We are now in Christ and made the righteousness of God in him. Amen? Amen. That's worth celebrating. And uh, I just pray that you come to know Jesus if you haven't met him, that you see his great love for you and you see that this resurrection power we speak of, this new life that I've experienced and many of my friends have experienced is for everybody. It's not for a select elect. It's not just for a few. It's not even for some. God wants everyone to know him. God has come and sent Jesus to save every single human being on this planet. And Jesus died as much for a person that hasn't accepted him as he died for me. And I just pray that somehow, as I share some things that Jesus modeled, that you would sense the Lord in your life, no matter where you're at in your life today because I just know this for sure, he is alive and because he lives, I through faith now will live forever in relationship with God. And I want that for everyone. God wants that for everyone. So let me share some parables here. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That's all a parable is, it's an earthly story. It's something that we all understand and we can connect with, but it has a heavenly meaning. And Jesus in Luke chapter 15 told three different stories, three different parables, revealing God's love for people, revealing God's nature toward everyone and how he views us all as human beings and of what great value everyone within the sound of my voice has in the eyes of God. And Jesus not only modeled that, he taught that in these parables. So I wanna start in, in Luke chapter 15 where we see that Jesus is the friend of sinners. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Now that should be good news for everybody. So I'm gonna say it again and you get to respond a little better. Yeah. Jesus is the friend of sinners. Yeah. Amen. Well, that was better even though I pulled it out of you. Luke 15, one through three, Jesus is dealing with the religious community here. He's dealing with Pharisees. He's dealing with teachers of the law and their attitude toward lost people. I want you to see what Jesus said here, he said, tax collectors and other notorious sinners, I love that, notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. 
Y'all didn't see that? Isn't that, isn't that awesome that Jesus didn't just draw a holier-than-thou crowd? He didn't just draw righteous people. He drew sinners, notorious sinners. And they were, they were drawn to him and the message that he came to bring. Years ago, we, we had a, a, a drug ring that was busted in the geographical area, and, and it was a pretty big deal. And they had a meth lab that was producing all kinds of things. And so it got shut down, multiple people got arrested, and one of the police officers of that, of that raid attended here. And so the next week he brought me off to the side. He said, man, we just shut down one of the biggest drug rings around here. And man, lots of people went to jail. And he said, we were trying to clean up and underneath the tables were your cassette tapes. <laughs> now that didn't help me in the religious community very much, but I was excited about the heart of people. Here's people that are doing something really bad, something that's not good and, and can never be condoned. And yet, listen, they were seeking God. They were listening to the word. Now, they didn't quite get the message, but when, when they got hauled off to jail, now we had a captive audience to get the message to them. The bottom line is God loves people. And many times as a church, we forget what this stuff is all about and God's love for people that are hurting and people that are lost and struggling because I don't know if you remember where you came from, but I remember where I came from and I can never look down on a sinner. I can never look down on anyone that is, that is really bound by darkness. That used to be me. And Jesus set me free not to look down on those people, but he set me free to get them this good news that they can be free too, amen? So all kinds of people are listening to Jesus. Now watch this. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people. Look at this, this is really bad. Even eating with them. Can you imagine that? I love the King James Bible. It says that he eats with sinners and Republicans. Just, I mean, the scum of the earth, the bottom of the food chain. See, I've discovered in our world that we've gotten so far toward hell itself and darkness that there are pockets in our culture that hate other pockets of our culture and just people that are mean to one another and unfriendly and unkind. And unfortunately, in many of our churches, we can tend to become that way. And that is not the heart of God. It's not my heart. It should never be our heart as a church to, to not have a love and a concern for hurting people, for lost people. So he's eating, he's eating with them. So Jesus began to tell these three parables, these three stories in the light of what just happened, in the light of these religious people thinking they're better than other people or they have more value to God than people who are not serving God. See, God sees things so differently than we see things, and we have to learn as believers this resurrection power we talk about, this new life is the very life of Jesus, and we need to see people like God sees people, amen? And so these three stories are just awesome, and two of them have things totally in common, and then the third story has some nuance to it and some some twists that are a little different than the first two stories. And yet all three stories speak of God's, of God's great love for us. So in these three stories, Jesus is explaining how people get lost, how people are lost, how people find themselves in a place separated from God. And so the story is the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And so I'm just gonna tell them and highlight them and bring the, the common theme that that is revealed by, by Jesus, because Jesus came to show us God. He came to show us what God was like. He came to show us the heartbeat of God. Jesus is the Bible, if you will, with eyeballs and feet, amen? He manifested the true nature of God. And here's Jesus loving, hurting people. And the religious community was struggling with it. And so in the first story, he tells the story of a lost sheep, and he talks about a 100 sheep and how that one one is lost, one gets lost. Now, I want you to hear me, so please pay attention on this. I'm calling it unintentionally lost. Unintentionally lost. The, the sheep didn't wake up one day and just decide, I don't wanna be a part of the family. I don't wanna be a part of the herd. I don't like the shepherd, I'm out of here. No, it drifted 
It drifted. When I say unintentionally lost, I'm not talking about people aren't accountable for their lives. Did you hear me say that? I'm talking about stuff happens in our lives and I'm talking about you have family members, dear ones. We have friends, we have coworkers we work with every day of the week that they simply have drifted from God. They simply have found themselves in a place they didn't wake up one morning and go, I just hate God and I don't want nothing to do with God and I don't want to hear anything about God. No, this lost sheep simply drifted. You can get off course in life just a little bit and as, as God is moving his people forward and you're just off a little bit in time, you're way over here. And you just wake up one day and you're not sure how you even got there. But this shepherd leaves the 99, leaves the 99, goes after the one sheep and takes the sheep and puts it on his shoulder. Evidently, the sheep wasn't a rebellious sheep. It didn't hate the shepherd. It wasn't resisting or rebelling. It was lost. And he puts it on his shoulders and he brings it He brings it back. So in the story, we see God's great value for human life. How that God loves us all, no matter where we are, what we're doing, what we're not doing. His love for us is the same, and he values us. He values us enough to leave the 99. He's not saying, like I heard one time in this story, you know, God loves lost people more than saved people, or those that have gone astray more than those that have remained faithful. He's not saying that at all. He's saying he's committed to all human life and that everybody is of value and matters and matters to God. Again, this person didn't choose in the sense of this is where I want to be. They simply drifted. And we have family members again, friends. Most of the people I run into are in this category. Man, they just, they just have, have made some, some choices that were minor and they just drifted a little here and drifted a little here and before you know it, they're way over here. How many of you know Jesus is pursuing those people not for harm but for good? We need to pursue those people not for harm but for good. People drift, they still have great value to God and God pursues them for good. Now, watch what happens though when he finds the lost sheep and brings the lost sheep back to the to the family, to the herd. In Luke 15, 7, the scriptures say, in the same way, just like, just like this man found this lost sheep that had such value to him and brought it back to the fold and then called his friends and rejoiced because he found the one that was lost, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven. Dear ones, there is a heaven. I don't care what you've been told or what you've heard. Jesus told us there's a heaven. And he says that when one person comes to Christ, accepts him as Lord, he says, there's something that happens. There's joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents of sin and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You know, if you, if you are committed to Christ, if you're a part of the family of God, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? Die and go to heaven. But how many of you know somebody lost, something worse can happen to them? And God knows that when we forget that in our church culture many, many times. And so there's this rejoicing over one commitment to Christ. This This is our fifth service. And I'm not sure how many people, but it's been more than one, I know that, have given their life to Christ on this weekend alone. I'm telling you, heaven is throwing a party right now and we don't wanna be outdone. We don't want to be outdone. Again, he goes after it and brings it, brings it home, and then there's rejoicing. Now, the lost coin is verses 8 through 10, and look at my terminology here. Unexpectedly lost. I want you to think about that for a minute. People unintentionally drift, and we need to show them God's love and, and bring them home. People unexpectedly, the lost coin The coin had no no will involved. It's a lost coin. And and I'm telling you, people in in ways they don't understand through a crisis, through the death of a child, through an unwanted divorce, on and on I could go with the pains of life that, that affect people and it damages them and they don't even realize, like a lost coin, that they're being separated from God gradually through that pain and through that that hurt. In the lost coin, this lady has all this money and she loses one coin and she tears the whole house apart to find that one coin. There is, there is no, this is no accident that Jesus used a woman in this story. 
Because how many of you know if one of us guys loses a coin, we might go to the couch and look behind the cushions for a minute, but if it ain't there, we're done. We're done. <laughs> Not a woman of the house. She tears the whole house apart till she finds the coin because the coin has value to her. Just like the, the shepherd didn't look and go, I got 99, okay, I lost one, no big deal. No, I got 99, but I'm in charge of 100 and I want 100 and I'm gonna have 100 and went after the one. The lady didn't look at her money and go, hey, this is enough. God doesn't look at where the church is today and the commitments that have been made globally and say, that's enough. No, God's looking for the lost sheep and he's looking for the lost coin, the lost coin. I've met people my whole life that they can't explain and I can't, can't explain how in the world did they get in this condition? It was like unexpected. Have you ever done anything that you know in your heart you're kind of walking away from God, but you think you're getting away with it? I'm the only one honest here today. Any, by the way, one of my little nervous things is if I start doing my fingernails like that, that means I just told on myself. So <laughs> you kind of do something and you know that wasn't quite right, but it's no big deal. And then you do that again in other areas. And before you know it, listen, the unexpected avalanche of the consequences of sin and darkness just fall in on you. I meet people like this all the time, like this lost coin. They didn't plan on being where they find themselves now in life. And they need to know they still have great value to God. They need to, to know that not only God loves them, but we as the people of God love them and that we're pursuing them. God's pursuing them, but not for harm. We're pursuing them for good. Man, anybody that's got what I have wants everybody to have it. You just want everybody to have it. And so you, you're gonna make sure you, you reach out to them. So there are unexpected casualties of sin. Sin always has consequences. It always has like a payday. And while God's not the one punishing you for sin, he's not the one pouring wrath out on you for sin, sin has like a seed, a harvest. And many times we're reaping all these unexpected consequences of not seeking God, unexpected consequences of not doing the right thing. And God loves us and God is pursuing us again for good. Look at what happens when she finds, when she finds the lost coin. She calls her friends and asks them to rejoice. Verse 10 in the New Living. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. So what I want you to hear today, what I want you to hopefully by the Spirit feel in your heart is that God cares about our families that are like lost sheep, our families that are like this lost coin, our coworkers, our, our friends that we, that we hang out with, God cares about them and we need to have the heart of God and care as well. All right, the lost son, the reference is 11 through 32 of Luke 15 again, and the lost son found himself in a place because of poor lifestyle choices, poor lifestyle choices. Now, there's a few of you, you can kind of go, well, I kind of identify with the sheep. And then there's a few of you, well, I'm definitely that coin. I got no idea how I got here or even where I'm at. <laughs> but there's some of us, myself included, that identify with the lost son because I can give you all kinds of excuses why I did what I did. All I know is I can give you reasons that I gave up on God, Amen. that I, I, I felt like I can't measure up. I felt like I was somehow flawed and I can't live this life. And, and I never got angry at God. I never rebelled against God, but I, but I made some poor lifestyle choices and I made some choices that got me away from God pretty quick and got me in a place I didn't plan on being and want to be, but my choices got me there. That's what this story of the lost son is all about. This boy, this boy, he bothers me. While I identify with the lost son in my own personal relationship with God and, and what happened to me, there's some things about the lost son bother me and, and they noticeably bother me and I can't hide it. I, I can't hide it. That when you start talking about this boy, I don't like part of this story. Now I know some of you read the Bible. I just, I just wish I could touch you. You read the Bible and angels sing, gold dust falls out of the sky and you just love it. Man, I read the Bible and go, I don't like that. <laughs> Amen. And so here's these two boys, an older boy and a younger boy. And the younger boy comes to his dad 
And basically, in so many words, he says, look, you're going to live to be old, old. And by the time you die, I'll be old, and I won't be young enough to enjoy the money. So I want my inheritance now. See, y'all didn't hear that. (laughs) Pastor Lee heard it. (laughs) I know the laugh of the sheep. (laughs) That just irritates me to this day. Can you imagine a son coming to you and saying, look, Dad, I can't hardly picture my boys and my younger boy coming to me and saying, look, we all know you're believing to live to be 120, and so when you die, we're going to be 100. We won't have any fun with the money. We want the money now. (laughs) Y'all don't feel this. I mean, I I can't imagine how I would react. I got an idea. It'd be something like inheritance. What inheritance? You owe me a quarter of a million dollars in food, clothes, and shelter. Combat pay. Amen. And so this father's a bigger father than me. He gives the, the son, he gives actually both boys their inheritance. This boy, the younger boy, in two days decides, I'm out of here. He he rejects his family. He rejects his father. He rejects his upbringing. This was a godly father. This was a godly man, obviously, by his lifestyle. And so this boy has just thrown everything out the door. He takes the money. He squanders every bit of it. He he indulges in prostitution and and makes what I call fair-weather friends. How many of you know fair-weather friends just hang out with you as long as you got money? And when the money ran out, the friends are gone. Now he's hungry. Now he he needs shelter. And he's trying to get a job, and he actually goes to a pig farmer, saints. A pig farmer. And he wants to work for a pig farmer. you got to remember who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to kosher Jews. That hadn't even sunk in. Bless y'all's heart. (laughs) This is bad. And not only do kosher Jews not eat pig... He wants to eat the pig food. This is bad. This is pretty low. I mean, this is so low. I mean, this is like the belly of a snake in a wagon wheel rut. You can't get any lower than this. And yet something happens to this boy that I pray for my generation. I pray for your children. Because we are raising a generation that refuses to take personal responsibility for their actions or their lives. And yet this young boy came to the end finally, and he says he came to himself. And listen, he took personal responsibility. He said, I have sinned against heaven and you, meaning his father. And then he, he made a second decision. I'm going home. I'm returning to home. The servants in my father's house aren't hungry. They have plenty of food. They have clothes. They have shelter. And here I am starving wanting to eat pig food, and I'm going home. And the Bible says his father saw him from afar off. Now watch a twist. In the lost sheep, the owner went after it. In the lost coin, the owner went after it. In the lost son, the father did not chase after him. The father honored his free will choice, even though it was a bad choice. God will honor your free will all the way to the gates of hell. God will honor your choice to love him and accept you into the family of God and change your life in eternity, or he will honor your hating of him. He will honor your rejecting of him. He will honor your free will choices in this life and beyond this life. I'm here to tell you, let's make some better choices. Let's wake up and come home. Let's wake up and come home. And so he sees this boy a long way off and it says he came running out after him and nearly beat him to death because of all his sins. It doesn't say that and you know it in your heart, don't you? No, he ran after him for good, not for harm. Once the boy repented, once the boy turned to return, the father saw him and ran out, had compassion and mercy on him, kissed him and hugged him. And when he started his story that I just want to be a hired servant, the father basically said, hush that stuff up. Get this boy a robe, a ring, and some shoes, and we're fixing to throw a party. We're going to throw a party. That's the heart of God. Now let's walk through this because I believe the prodigal son speaks to many. The other two definitely speak to probably a two-thirds, but there's definitely a third of us that we got to deal with our personal choices and make good choices in these last days. 
So he takes personal responsibility, watch this, for his sins and doesn't play the blame game. This boy doesn't blame the father and he could have come up with all kinds of reasons to blame his father for letting him go, letting him make a poor lifestyle choice, for not giving him enough inheritance to last longer. He could have blamed the fig, par fig farmer, the pig farmer. <laughs> he could have blamed the pig farmer. He could have blamed and blamed and blamed. And again, my heart breaks for a young generation that's coming up that they have, they have professionally developed the blame game. And that's a flaw that began in the garden with Adam and Eve who made some poor lifestyle choices, who made the wrong choice and disobeyed God. And when God lovingly confronted them, he didn't, he didn't punish them, he didn't leave them, he didn't turn on them. But he came and told him, look, this has consequences. And when he tried to deal with Adam, listen, Adam blamed two people. Adam blamed the woman and God. You remember what Adam said when, when God confronted him in the garden for his sin? He said, it was the woman that you gave me. This is your fault. You said it wasn't good for me to be alone. I didn't come to you. You came to me. You took this woman out of me. You built her body, brought her back. You're to blame. Do you know how many people, even in religious circles, blame God Amen. for the consequences of our own actions, yep. falsely accuse God as punishing or cursing or, or pouring wrath out on us? He goes to the woman, and the woman blames the snake. It was the serpent. There's some of you who will remember this. The woman basically said, the devil made me do it. Yep. How many of you remember Flip Wilson? Amen. About, about four of you, praise God. I felt kind of sorry for the devil. He's looking around and, and, and he doesn't have anybody to blame. He doesn't even have a leg to stand on. <laughs> That'll hit you later, praise God. So maybe the buck does stop with the devil with darkness and evil, but we can't be blaming God falsely or blaming the devil for our poor lifestyle choices. He took personal responsibility. Again, even in our culture today, you can see it everywhere you go. That many times people are leaning clean over here and when God forbid that someone would come into our church. God forbid that someone who has no fear of God, no conscience, no sense of right and wrong, no sense of accountability, no sense of an afterlife, they would come in here and shed and kill somebody and shed innocent blood. God forbid that any of us as parents, any of us in our community would have to deal with someone that is pure evil, that we've been unwilling to deal with in our culture, that has no fear of God in their heart. And I'm not talking about being afraid of God, I'm talking about respect for God. No, no sense of a conscience, no sense of a, of, of a, of a value of human life and go into one of our schools and and, and, and kill our kids. I get it. I wish I could take time to explain it to many of you, and this isn't the best forum. But when you raise a generation and kill millions of babies, you send a signal there's no value to life. When, when you talk about exterminating your parents and, and assisted suicide, you devalue human life. When you tell a whole generation there's something evil and bad about the Ten Commandments and we don't want it on our property, and one of them says, thou shalt not kill. When they're saturated daily with video games of murder and, sh and shedding blood, they don't go to church anymore. There's no Bible available. There's no preacher to speak the truth in love. You wind up with an entire generation that doesn't value human life. And maybe, maybe we need to take personal responsibility and maybe we as a people need to say we have sinned against God in removing him out of our culture. If we're not blaming God for the killing of our kids, we swing to the other side of the pendulum and we blame guns or the NRA. Guns don't kill people. Evil people kill people, and we need to wake up. We need to wake up. The first murder in the Bible was, a, was with a rock. 
And we can band all the rocks on the planet and evil people, if not dealt with properly, will continue to shed innocent blood. All I'm saying is there's a point where we've got to take some responsibility for our own lives, for our own actions, and like this young kid, come to our senses and quit blaming everybody else and everything else. So he repented. He said, I have sinned against both heaven and you. Then he returned to to home. He returned to God. I will come home to my father. Verse 18. Then with this boy, there was rejoicing again. The father was filled with love and compassion and and wants to welcome us home, wants to draw us home. Verse 20. How many of you know, whether you're saved or lost, you are too great a creation of God for sin. God didn't create any of us to live in sin. Sin destroys our bodies. Sin destroys our mind, our soul, our our will, our emotions. And can I get a witness that sin destroys relationships around us? God didn't create us for sin. He didn't create us to live in darkness. Maybe you're a lost sheep and you, you, just, you just drifted, but you got to come home. Maybe you're like the lost coin. You have no idea how you got here or why you're where you're at. But come home. Or maybe we've made some poor lifestyle choices and we need to... We need to repent of our sin. God, I've sinned against you. All have sinned, dear ones, and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. We all need a Savior. His name is Jesus. We all need power to change. It's resurrection power, and it comes through faith in Jesus, the resurrection. Amen? Come on, somebody. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. Again, this boy, this boy, no matter what he did to God, to the father, had great value. God said, put a robe on that, on that boy immediately. How many of you know when you come to Jesus, if you come home today, no matter where you are, who you are, the first thing God does is put a robe of righteousness on you. Your sins are washed in the blood of Jesus, and you are made righteous by your simple faith in Jesus with a holy, righteous God. Secondly, it's like he puts this ring on on our finger, in our spirit man, in our inner man, in which God has married himself to you. Jesus has married himself to me. Jesus is committed unto me, unto death in a marriage type relationship through my simple faith. And I am so glad, I am so glad that God hates divorce. Because I've not always been a good bride to Jesus, but he'll never leave, he'll never forsake me. I got a ring on my inner man and he's committed unto me unto death, amen? And then shoes, man, this boy was, was shoeless because shoes represent in this culture poverty and, and pure slavery. And the father said, that won't do in my house. You put some new shoes on this boy because we're on a new path now and we're on a new walk now and it's gonna be glorious. It's gonna be glorious, amen? Amen. Now, the older, bo- the older brother is the real issue of the story. Everything I just said affirms what he said about the sheep and he said about the coin. But he says something here he didn't say about the other two, and that's the older boy. This older boy literally was angry at the father for forgiving his brother, for being merciful to his brother. That's 25 through 32. This represents religion and the judgment people have that is not a healthy judgment on one another. This this older boy was angry at grace. This older boy was upset that the younger brother was loved and forgiven and restored. Now, I get this, but I don't get this. And no, I'm not confused, and I may be confusing you, but I do get this, but I don't get this. I don't get how any of us could truly be saved and resent someone else getting saved. Someone else who hadn't been to church maybe or have never read a Bible or, or, or have never even prayed. And suddenly they, they repent and they return and God gives them a full inheritance equal to yours. I don't get being angry about that, but I see it all the time in religious circles. You know, some of you, like this older brother, you think you're earning everything from God. So if somebody just freely gets it by grace, it offends you. Grace offends legalistic people. Grace offends religious people because they think they've got to do this, do this, do this to get God to love them. Do this, do this, do this to get God to bless them. And so somebody else comes along and and, and they don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't act like you. And they call upon the name of the Lord and God heals them. God blesses them. And you're all angry. 
How many of you know that, that whatever we have as believers, we've not earned it? Okay, that's not enough of you. Maybe there's more. Hey, I'm excited. There must be a lot of lost people here today. Because, I mean, that was pretty good. I, I don't know about you, but everything I have has come freely through God's grace through simple faith. So why would I resent somebody else because they don't look like me or think like me and God blesses them? And yet religion does it all the time. You know, there's a lot of things personally I don't like, but I'm not hung up on it. I don't judge people after it. I certainly am not angry at them or, or treat them with disrespect. You know, like, I, they don't get upset at me for this, but I, I don't like tattoos. But I don't care. I've got friends who got tattoos, I'm telling you, from their head to their toe, all over their, well, the part of their body I've seen. <laughs> I don't want to go where my brain just went. <laughs> I don't like that. But God doesn't care about it. Listen, tattooing, it, just because I don't like personally tattoos, you haven't devalued your life by tattooing your body in the eyes of God. I don't like earrings all over your body. I don't like earrings on guys. I don't like earrings in your nose and your belly button. And let me just stop. <laughs> but, but that has nothing to do with God's love for you. It has nothing. To, it doesn't even mean I'm right and you're wrong. It means I have a personal preference. I don't care for that. But am I, am I of more value to God because of that? And we can name a lot of other things maybe that are true sins in people's lives. Sin, listen to me. Here's what happened to me. When I walked away from God, what sin done to me that I didn't factor in was it, it caused me to devalue me. I had participated in sin long enough and gotten far enough away from God that I felt unworthy. I felt devalued. But let me tell you something. God never, ever devalued my worth no matter where I went. God didn't leave me, I left God. God didn't forsake me, I forsook God. And you may give up on God and you may not even believe in God. You may be listening to me right now saying, I don't even believe in God, I got some bad news for you. You may not believe in God, but he believes in you. He believes in you, he died for you as much as he died for me. So you can't even shake me on that kind of unbelief because I don't care if you don't believe in God, I know God believes in you and I'm gonna keep praying and believing in you. This father never gave up on this renegade boy. He was waiting for that boy to repent and return, and the minute that boy turned in his heart, he ran him down. Now, let's look at the last verse of chapter 15 because of this rejoicing, and I love this. Look at what this says here that, that I, I put, we had, did you notice that had is in yellow? Some of you didn't notice that, all right. I did that on purpose. You know why? I want you to see it. Watch this. We had to celebrate this happy day. We had to. Man, I tell you, I personally don't want to be that older boy. I never want to despise the grace of God. I never want to, want to be offended by God's grace and God's love for people and all people and any kind of people. I had a guy one time kind of jumped on me, and I tell you, sometimes God really does bail me out. I, I just, anybody besides me, when somebody jumps on you, sometimes you don't react right. And then when you do react right, you just go, thank you, Jesus. I was, I was awesome. One time. But he jumped on me and he said, man, I've heard you. And I'm just telling you right now, he's a preacher. And he said, that is just cheap grace you're preaching. And that, that offended me. It's like cheap grace. Don't you put a price on God's grace. There's no such thing as cheap grace. That's a cost. Grace is free, and God has freely loved you. God has freely committed himself to you. God will never, ever give up on one human being on this planet till they breathe their last breath, and then he doesn't give up on them. He honors their choice. He honors their choice. We had to celebrate this happy. We had to. Did you notice it's in, it's in yellow? See, mo more of you noticed it finally. We had to rejoice. This isn't a, uh, it's not really a choice. Man, when somebody gets saved as a human being, I need to celebrate. We as a church, we never need to forget even what God's doing in our life. And the ultimate goal is to reach somebody with this same life. He said, we had, we had. In a minute, I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna quit. I'm all excited. <laughs> Calm down. 
in a minute I'm going to quit. And, and I know there's somebody going to make a commitment. I just know it. And I'm telling you, I'm going to cut a rug for Jesus. As a church, we need to keep learning to be excited about people giving their life to Jesus. We had. Did you notice it's in yellow? Okay, we're getting there. I about, I about got all of you. We had. We don't have a choice in this. Well, I don't believe they really got saved. Well, I'm not sure they're doing it right. Well, you never know people's hearts. And get out of our church. Just leave. Find a dead church. There's plenty of them. Because when somebody raises their hand and says, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life, man, I believe with all my heart the Holy Ghost is doing that, and they mean it. And they mean it. All right. We had. Did you see it's in yellow? <laughs> we had. We had to celebrate this. Happy. Do you know when people make a commitment to Christ in a service like this, do you know how long their parents have been praying? Do you know how many kids have been praying for their parents? Do you know how many people have been praying for a friend or a relative? Years. And they made that commitment. We're going to stand here and act like the older brother. Not in my lifetime. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life and he was lost, but now he is found. Let's break it down and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for a commitment. Number one, despite your circumstances or situation today, you are of great value to God. Amen. God loves you right where you are. Listen, we'll accept you right where you are by his grace with the full intent by that same grace to get you where you need to be in the family of God. Number two, Jesus, Jesus wants to be your friend. Amen. Jesus wants to be your friend. You've got to start seeing God. If you don't make a commitment today, I am believing that my words are seeds. They're getting in your heart and, and the Holy Spirit's gonna water those seeds. And that if you will just see Jesus as a friend, you're gonna have an encounter with him and have your life changed. Number three, we need to repent of sin and return to God. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot, but I love you. I love you. I would rather people repent of sin and return to God than repent of sin and just return to church. Did you get it? If people repent of sin and just return to church and not return to God they become the Pharisees that are sitting among us. And so I'd rather you repent of your sin and return to God and not go to church than to repent of your sin and go to church and not return to your creator that loves you so very much. Because if we repent and return to God, we will never become a Pharisee. We will love people and we will reach out to people the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. All right, number four, we and all of heaven rejoice. I'm going to have two calls quickly. The Holy Spirit's speaking to people. I'm confident of that. Maybe you're just a lost sheep. You didn't intend to not live for God. You didn't intend to drift, but it's time to come home. Maybe you're a lost coin and you sincerely have no idea how in the world did I get where I'm at in life. It doesn't matter. God loves you. Come home. Don't try to figure out how you got where you are. Just come home. And then I guarantee you there's people that you've made some poor lifestyle decisions and God's not angry with you. God is not punishing you, but sin has its own consequences and you just need to repent of your sin and return to God. I want you to bow your head with me. Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that hasn't made that commitment to Christ, maybe they're good people. Obviously they've, they've come to church on a major day of celebration of the community of faith. So they're, they're not angry at you. They're not hating you. And so if they're in that category of lost sheep, open their eyes, open their ears, come home. Lost coin, open their eyes, open their ears to come home. And those of us like myself years ago that, man, I just made some bad, bad lifestyle choices and it took me away from God. I had to repent of my sin and return home.
If you want to make that commitment today, I would be so honored. I would be blessed beyond measure to pray with you right where you sit and to believe for a miracle of a change on the inside of your heart because I'm not asking you today in your own power to change your life. I'm not asking you today to quit anything or start anything. I'm inviting you today to say yes to Jesus. Just say yes to the creator as a part of his creation. He's pursuing you right now. And it's, it's for love, not for harm. If that's you and you want me to pray for you right where you sit, I'm going to ask you just to lift up your hand as a free will act of faith and then make sure I see it and then you can put it back down because I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I see these three hands, four hands right here, five hands right there, six. That's one section, seven in one section, eight in one section. Give me a minute if you're in another section. Anybody else in that section? I see hands up here. God bless you. You can put it back down. I see a hand right here. God bless you. How, oh, I'm about to shout and dance. I love you. This is awesome. Anybody else? As I scan now the crowd, because I missed hands all over here. I see your hand. I see your hand at the back back there. Your hand right up front. In the balcony, it's harder for me to see because of the light. So make sure I see your hand. I see a hand right over here. You can put it down. Hallelujah. Hurry, raise it. I'm getting excited. Because your heart's already changed. If you've raised your hand, God's already seen your heart. We just need to seal it with a confession of faith. Anybody else? I see a hand over there, a hand over there. Man, this is awesome. A hand back there. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, heaven's already shouting. Heaven's already shouting. Okay, I, I see it. Praise God. You can put your hand down. Man, I don't even know how many that was. That's awesome. All right, I'm going I'm to just give you 15 more seconds because every time I wait, God bless you. That's worth waiting for just a, you know, I know we all have family to get to. We, we've all got, I see your hand. We're just going to sit here for a minute. And I know we got things to go do, but saints, do you realize how many people this is Amen. that are making a commitment? That they're going to a secured heaven for them now. Okay, I see a hand up here. Thank you for helping me, Harvey. Man, that's awesome. Last night, I was praying this prayer. I'm going to ask you all to pray with me. And there was a little boy at the back. He couldn't have been six years old, five years old. He was hollering it out. And I got tickled him repeating after me. <laughs> Kids sense God. I see your hand. God bless you. Man, this is our fifth service. And I can't tell you how excited I am. This is over the top. Okay, another hand. You're pointing, Wayne, where are you pointing? I didn't see it. Okay, you saw it, though. Good. I don't see it. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for helping me. Father, this is awesome. We are, we are so thankful. I guarantee there's not a person that raised their hand that you haven't heard the prayers of their family, the prayers of their friends, the prayer of our church. And I just want to say thank you for a moment. I'm grateful. They will never regret this decision. They will never regret this decision. Amen. And so I thank you as I pray with them and as a church we pray with them, the miracle. Salvation is a miracle. Only you can change our heart. Only you can rip out that old hard heart and put a soft heart. And so I never take it lightly. I'm so grateful. Let's all pray with those that raised their hand. And if you raised your hand, I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer of faith. And, and if you mean it with all your heart, I promise you, God means it with all his heart and he'll change your heart. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I confess that I'm not right, but I wanna be right. I wanna make things right. I can't do enough to be made right. I can't quit enough to be made right. I need help. I believe Jesus Christ is that help. He is the Son of God. He came to this earth, lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and took my place. He bore my sins and the punishment for all my sins. He died, was buried. On the third day, he rose again. He is alive, and I confess him as Lord, as my Lord my God, my King that is soon coming. Thank you now for forgiving me 
of all sins and changing my heart. Help me now from my heart serve you all the days of my life. Amen and amen. Wow. Hallelujah. Woo! That's awesome. Yeah, standing ovation. <laughs> amen. We mean it. We mean it. Those of you that made a commitment, we mean it from our heart. Welcome home. Amen. Welcome home. God has secured an eternal home for you in Jesus Christ as a part of the family of God.